one of the oldest cliches about life, one that has been used all over the world and all the time from Egypt and China and everywhere, is that life is a journey. And uh, the older you get, the more you realize the truth of it, as you realize the terrible, profound truth of every cliche. It, it has become a cliche because it's so true. And uh, life is a journey which many of us make toward disaster and some make toward triumph. And uh, to be able to see that really as clearly, I think uh, we can best look at the work of Rembrandt, which uh, moves from a joyous kind of youth to a very prosperous and uh, in, a, in a way almost smug middle age into the, an old age that is graced by something that is not um, anything that we can ever identify, but which has its quality of the greatest kind of spiritual triumph. Anything that we make, we make in our own image. We really don't have any choice about it. It just, it, it's just what we do and what everybody, everybody has always done. It, it, we haven't any other way to make anything, so that's, that's what it turns out to be in our own image. And our, we are physical beings and, and uh, emotional beings, intellectual beings, and actually all the things that we make have these aspects. They have an aspect of, uh, you know, whether it's a chair or whether it's a painting, it has its physical aspect and its uh, intellectual, how it was that you decided to make this thing on what grounds, whether it was just purely stylistic or pragmatic or whatever it was, but it's an act of the intellect. And then the, the life of, of feeling, the thing, the way that that feels is expressed in, in uh, every object that we make as human beings. They are really like ourselves. They are made in our own image. We never can tell uh, what makes these changes, what makes large general changes, uh, but uh, we can see the results. And when we look at the work of somebody like Rembrandt, uh, we can we see the changes. We know that he moved from being uh, well, sort of extroverted, brilliant, uh, marvelously successful, very socially aware, and that is, he had lots of pr apprentices and, and students, uh, into some kind of isolation, some kind of, of um, removal from that world. And uh, we don't know really what caused it. We never can know, you see, we never really can know. Uh, what caused this kind of change? People say that it had something to do, and it, and it did, but you don't know which is cause and effect. With his bankruptcy, with the uh, death of his wife, with the death of his children. Uh, but what really brought about the depth of change that we can see in his work uh, is we'll never know. We just can experience it, we can know it. And we can't really talk about it. You see, that's the extraordinary thing because the life of feeling has no vocabulary. Emotions have vocabulary. Physical beings can be described. But the life of feeling is really dumb. It, it can't speak. And that's why people always say um, that they're too moved uh, to speak. They, they can't say anything. Uh, is it, in a way, it gives an external, not a, a word, not a voice, but an external realization of all the things that we feel. This is true of the greatest works of art, and it's what makes them the greatest works of art. Uh, it's only in modern times that we have knowledge of the artist, but in the case of Rembrandt, we have a whole special knowledge because he, more than any other painter, occupied himself with self-portraits all of his life, throughout his whole life, great numbers of them. And in, in them, you can see, you can see the kind of growth that he undergoes, you can see the changes that he makes, you can see the, the whole difference of uh, the vision of his life better than you can with uh, perhaps anyone else because more personally and more immediately. The fact that he, that he makes self-portraits, that this is a major part of, of his work, 
uh, is a, uh, itself, you see, very, very unusual and very extraordinary. And his life itself was, had a kind of dramatic personal intensity. And it, it's, um, when we look at the very earliest things that he did, he, he was born into a kind of, I suppose, middle class Miller family. And um, he was uh, apprenticed at an early age. And by the time he was 19, he was an, an accomplished artist. Uh, I think that that it's, it's uh, maybe there's something which is dramatically shortened about his life. He lived more personally, more immediately. The fact that he that he makes self-portraits, that this is a major part of, of his work, uh, is a, uh, itself, you see, very very unusual and very extraordinary. His uh, his life is short compared to Donatello and Goya, uh, but it's not short in, in the sense that he's taken off at an early age. Uh, see, even when he was very young, he spent a lot of time looking in the mirror. <laughs> and now I think there isn't a person in this room who didn't also spend a lot of time looking in the mirror when they were very young. It's one of the ways that we try to come, first of all, to know what we look like. Of course, in our modern times, it's a great thing because uh, uh, you have a bathroom. And it, it means that you can go and uh, be relatively private and study your face. <laughs> and also, make faces at yourself. But Rembrandt was no exception. Only Rembrandt set it down because he was not only an adolescent, he was also an artist. And he was at this time an apprentice and expected that was going to be his life, was to be an artist. And so he used himself as a way of finding uh, what kind of expressions are possible. Because you see, actually, painting is an art which is very much allied to drama. And many other artists have felt that the, that the quality of drama, the quality of that intensification and the, the uh, excitement of drama is something uh, which, uh, of course, which was very conspicuous in religious art because religion has the dramatic quality uh, that, is, uh, that makes the painting also dramatic. But in the 17th century, which is, and of course, Rembrandt really, you see, starts right in the beginning of the 17th century. In the 17th century, the, the sense of drama was so high and so sharp. It, it was, um, you, everybody knows, I think, that that's when the opera begins. It's not just that it must be dramatic, but it must unfold the whole world. It must be everything at once. It's a whole sense of the, of, of a largeness of vision and a dramatic quality of vision that the 17th century values. And it, sometimes, it, it's, I think it's, it, it may be because you have in the 17th century the introduction of a remarkable number of stimulants. It's when um, tobacco is, is introduced, you know, and it's when, and when it becomes a, well, it becomes a, a, a vice for people. It becomes something which is, took the kind of place of opium. Uh, people smoked and did nothing else. That was their work to do, to smoke, to sit and smoke. <laughs> they had places where they could sit and, and do nothing but smoke. And there are pictures of them, paintings of them, because they were new and extraordinary things. And it's also the time of the, of the uh, uh, distillation of spirits. And gin becomes, uh, frequently used, and whiskey, and so on, that really before, it had, that hadn't been no characteristic at all. There was uh, almost no use of any kind of spirit. So there was an accelerated life in the, in the 17th century. Everything, you know, the enlightenment, everything about it, had a quality of acceleration and, and a quality of high drama. So that, that coincides, you see, that's something which is, is subsumed in, in Rembrandt's experience and in his life, is this uh, quality of drama. One of the great achievements, one of the great desires and ideals of the Renaissance was to use the human body, the whole body to express anything, everything. And in the 17th century, that 
concentrates more on the face, and particularly, of course, in the northern countries, where uh, portraiture is one of the great arts, and where the portrait is really concentrated on the face or the face and the hands. Uh, now, another thing, of course, one of the great devices uh, in, in uh, art, in the paintings, uh, I guess really it's a, it's a reflection of the same thing that you have in the light of the 17th century, is the use, the dramatic use of light. Um, it, it starts uh, in the late 15th century, late 16th century, and it continues then until it really becomes the central thing, it's a, the subject matter of, of the 17th century is light. And it's how light creates things, how it destroys things, how it creates drama by intensification of light and dark. And it's almost always an artificial light. It's almost always a sense is that it's not a, an ordinary light, it's an artificial light. And the greater power, because the greater direction, the power to, to give a direction to it, makes uh, artificial light much more dramatic, of course. And, and it, it, that kind of uh, exploration, of course, is something which, which Rembrandt does all of his life. That is, he always is, is uh, uh, aware that the, the deepest change in his style is the, is the way that he handles life, the way that it, that it changes for him and changes uh, the, what, is, what he is expressing. Another thing about Rembrandt, all of his life, was that he loved to dress up. He loved costumes. And he dressed himself up. Now, at the, at the time of the 17th century, to wear a piece of armor was to wear a costume. It was, it, armor was obviously no, it was not necessary anymore, it was not used anymore. It was either uh, something to indicate a, a costume or something, if it was a, a special kind of armor, it might indicate a certain uh, social uh, past. But it's as, it's as costume that, that Rembrandt uses it, and he does this all his life. And the number of costumes, the number of uh, oriental costumes, of all kinds of, uh, of uh, folk costumes, and beautiful materials was a major part of what he owned, what he bought, what he uh, liked to have, and what he always has, uh, really, uh, throughout all of his life. It's a, it's, it's again, it's a 17th century uh, thing. And Rembrandt, you see, is, is so marvelously a 17th century and so absolutely transcends the 17th century. Mm -hmm. And here, you see his father in the same piece of armor. Because one, another thing that he did was dress his family up and paint them as various things. And dress himself up and paint himself as various things. So that it, it's this, this quality of drama is very strong, you see, and was, very, uh, was really very overt. He has such an, an eagerness to depict the world, to, to set it down, to show what the world is. And, and to and do this, there is such a, a passion about painting that he uses everything which lies at hand. He uses all of his family, he uses them over and over again, he uses himself. Everything really is something for him to paint. Everything exists really in, as paintable and, and he paints it. Like this is when he's, he's 21. Uh, he's already a, a painter. He's a perfectly, in a, in a way, a perfectly successful or honorable uh, painter. When he's 26 years old, in 1632, he paints this painting, which I'm sure you've seen reproduced a dozen times. It is the uh, anatomy lesson of Dr. Fultz, and it, it was a commission given as many at, at that time, it was the commonest form of commission, and there was in Holland, you know, the greatest uh, uh, interest in art and, and people dealing in art. Art really becomes a commodity in the 17th century in Holland. Rembrandt turns this thing into a very dramatic scene. And he makes it something which is absolutely directly in the center of the taste of the 17th century. One of the things that the 17th century liked was any kind of horror, any kind of suffering, any kind of, of uh, things to give them a, a, a 
thrill of, uh, of disgust or of astonishment or any, any kind of strong emotion. And so Rembrandt has put the corpse in this. And it's, a, it's the most corpse kind of corpse that you can imagine. <laughs> the face is, is, is everything that, that makes the corpse frightening. It's scary, scary corpse. And, and the, then the people's reaction to it is, again, it's a dramatic scene. And everybody's reaction is totally different from everybody else's, you see. It's a, the, some people are quite withdrawn look at the one at the top. He's not, he's not in, even interested. And look at the one that's leaning over and afraid he won't even miss something, you know. <laughs> and then the one next to him is, is sure and wishes he could miss something. <laughs> in his face. You see that the wonderful the juxtaposition of those two faces and the one so sharp and absolutely intellectual, sharp, clear intellectual face, and then, then the other one with so much sensitivity and so much emotion in his face that you'll probably have to take to drink or something if he continues to anatomize. And then the one in the back is just a person, uh, you know, the scholar is writing down what they, what's being said and being demonstrated that when he's teaching a class or when, uh, when he has to uh, do an operation or whatever it is. But it's, and then the one, you see behind these two in the front is really, uh, is really scared. He's really withdrawing and pulling back and his whole face has got that dubiety and distrust in it. And you see what, what a marvelous portrait he's on. Well, of course, you know what happened. Everybody does this the most dramatic thing. And he was simply catapulted into fame. He had made a picture that no one expected to be anything that hadn't been going on because that's what his work looked like. And, the, and it, instead, here this 26-year-old young man is simply uh, becomes a, a famous from, for this painting. Why not? Because it not only has it, of course, it was it an astonishment at the time, but it's been a fascinating and astonishing thing to be one ever since. It, 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 has a, it has this extraordinary kind of, of dramatic quality and richness to it, and that it just keeps people coming back. It's a, part, it, it's a psychological play between the faces. And, and you see, they are faces. They're, the body is not, the, the gesture of the body, the movement forward or the movement backward is important, but the physical qualities of the body is not nearly as important as the face and the psychological quality. And now, this started then from the time he was 26 to the time he was 36. It's a 10 year period of, of nothing but success. Success and joy and happiness popularity, fame, everything that anybody ever thought of as being desirable, and Rembrandt has in that period. And he's married to a very beautiful girl who had a very substantial dowry, and was uh, as attractive and pretty uh, as you could ask anybody to be. And he, this is his self, this is his marriage portrait. And you see, when you think of Rembrandt, you never think of him doing like that. up in his plumes and his velvet, and, uh, and, and radiantly happy, and he was radiantly happy. And, uh, and Saskia, uh, who was his wife, uh, was a, a, a perfectly beautiful as well as bringing him really a fortune. But he, at this time, didn't need it, you see, because he's just flooded with commissions. Everybody wants him to paint them. Everybody, uh, uh, not only that, they want to study with him. Uh, he has, and he's very, uh, um, uh, really fond of people and likes, enjoys it. So he has a great many students and a great many followers and a great many patrons. His, his life is rich. And what does he do? He buys art. He buys costumes. He buys a beautiful house. He buys everything uh, that is the same kind of rich and sumptuous world. 
that, this, that the 17th century is. In this period, in this uh, period between the time he's 20, 26 and the time he's 36, um, his work deepens and alters and becomes more absolutely his own. I think even between these two portraits you can see it, not just because this woman is older and therefore has more from his painting than, uh, than the other one had, but also because the, there is something, there's more uh, comprehension of the mystery, the inner mystery of being a human being. There's more sense of that, of the recognition of that ultimate mystery. Now there, there he is, he's, he's uh, 36 years old. He's a, a completely in charge of himself, of his life. Every, nothing could be nicer, see, it's in, in 1640. Nothing could be really, uh, really pleasanter, 1642. And he gets one of his great commissions. The commission has always been called the night watch, and it's now called the sortie of the Captain, uh, com Captain Cox Company. So what he does is show these people coming out uh, with their drummer and with the, the whole crowd. But what you see, the only thing you really see is the captain of the company and his lieutenant. Now, everybody paid the same. <laughs> everybody recognized that it was a good painting. Everybody recognized that it was a, a great painting. But the people who had commissioned it, recognized that it wasn't what they wanted. <laughs> and that, and it, 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 it stayed uh, recognized as a great painting. But it begins the kind of darkness that falls on Rembrandt uh, after 1642, as that's the date of, of this commission. And what happens also in 1642 is that Saskia dies. So his wife dies, and his life changes. And really interfere with his uh, painting in, in the sense of his success. He still has, in this uh, period after 1642, he still has commissions. There still are magnificent portraits, and some of the finest portraits that he does. Uh, but there is a, and this is very hard to explain, there's a diminution of his importance, not, if, not of the value that's given to him, but of the number of people that were gathered around him. His life takes a turn toward greater isolation and toward uh, greater uh, uh, darkness. Uh, it, it's something which, uh, uh, between uh, 1642 and say in the middle of 1655, uh, it increases in this quality of mystery and darkness and of uh, some kind of uh, quality which is entirely beyond any analysis. You can't really say what, what the thing is like. Now this is, it was painted when he was just, it, it was, it, one of the worst periods of his life, because at this time he became bankrupt. And we know what he had. And here are all of his things, and it would say, uh, paintings, uh, etchings chosen by Rembrandt, because he bought other people's work all the time. And, and, and so you, you see, that he was still respected, and he was always respected to the end of his life. Uh, he was known to be a great artist, but everything fell apart. And it was, and, and he was literally bankrupt. This is uh, 1656, and he only has six more years to live. Let's look at the next one. At this time, he gets a housekeeper who's named Hendrika Stoffels, who is his uh, companion, and devoted mistress for the rest of her life. No one knows exactly why he didn't marry her, because he had really lost uh, uh, Saskia's uh, money by this time. So it wasn't that. Uh, there was a scandal about it, because.
because she had a child by him. And, and it was part of this strange declining, the way the world was, his world was declining. And, in, and his interior world was becoming stronger. And what he saw and what he allows us to see is clearer and stronger than it ever was. But everything else around him is falling away. He doesn't change in some marvelous way, and I suppose it's a way that all of us don't change. He doesn't change in the sense that he doesn't lose the landmarks of his personality. He doesn't lose the, the power of drama. He doesn't lose the love of richness. He doesn't lose the, the sense of, of uh, the beauty and strangeness of the world. And, and yet, he sees that in a deeper and stronger way. And the, the quality is that everything begins to be interior. One of the things that happens is that there's a kind of, of a gentleness that comes over his vision. It's not only uh, that it is more profound, but there is more forgiveness, there's more uh, tenderness than, than uh, perhaps any other uh, painter ever had. And you're the man in the golden helmet. <clears throat> and again, you have that, the contrast. And it's a, a contrast that constantly uh, alerts so Rembrandt's imagination. The contrast between the, the splendor of the world, the grandeur of the world, gold, the beauty and, and lavishness and richness of gold, with the, with the pathos of the human being. So that this, the weight of this helmet, in all of its grandeur, is something which he doesn't really even know about. It's, what he is inside is something entirely different, and something which is uh, is thoughtful and which is uh, is, if anything, only oppressed by this weight of the gold on his head. He paints a number of Old Testament subjects. And this is Jacob blessing the children of Joseph, but you see all. This is permeated by a, an extraordinary inner light. It's not any kind of, of dramatic spotlight, but something which seems to move through the children and through the old man. And Bathsheba, uh, one of the paintings of the last years of his life. Uh, you remember that David saw her bathing on the rooftops and sent her husband into battle at the front line so he'd be killed. And for that, of course, suffered. But it's such a, a picture of beauty and innocence that will bring about ruin. And there's a kind of knowledge of the weight, the terrible weight and power of beauty and innocence. And there's Rembrandt in the last few years of his life, in the 1660s. Because you see, it, no one ever gave up on Rembrandt. Uh, he was still recognized as uh, one of the greatest painters of Paul. He still got uh, commissions. And from his uh, friend, Jan Steeks, uh, he, this is a portrait which he did of him. And he did a number of portraits in the early 60s. And it's, uh, it's, it's a, they are some of the most extraordinary and beautiful portraits in the world. And they are completely personal and absolutely accurate and with a, a whole recognition of what this person can be. And in the, in the last years of his life, in, in 62, 1662, he got one of the biggest commissions Yet it, 
differences between the men, but showing it in a, in this, in a, a, a way which is like a, like a novel rather than like a drama. It's like there's something that's an unfolding, such as moves um, quietly but continually unfolding what they are. And it, see, there's no way that you can say how this is done. I mean, this is, there's no way to describe what it is that Rembrandt is able to do that gives to these things the quality of life and the quality of mystery and the quality of all of the range of life, of all of the, all of its, uh, all of its in intricacy. See, you think, well, it's, there's a kind of simplicity to it in terms of painting. It's, a, it's direct and simple in its painting, but it's the most complex in the, in the experience or meaning of it. That what we get from it is a thing of so, is such complexity and subtlety that it absolutely cannot be described in words. And yet what is there is, is as if it were nothing. Now I want to show you some examples that will, that will in a way, help, help you to see what it is that he achieves in his life. Because he moves from that kind of, of, of absolute being at the center of what is going on at the center in terms of being in the right place at the right time, at the center in terms of, of knowing exactly what it is that he must do and being able to do it, and in the center in uh, comprehending taste, which is really identical to his own. He's, he knows uh, what he wants, and he wants drama, and he wants the, uh, the brilliance of light and dark, and he wants the drama of the presentation of something. Uh, and it is the story that God tells <coughs> Abraham to sacrifice his son, and uh, he he uh, he does. He, he agrees to, and he binds him, and is about to kill him when the angel comes down and strikes the uh, knife from his hand. Now you see, out of this story, uh, Rembrandt has extracted the exact moment of the most ex intense drama. The most and the knife flies through the air. Already you see a great trick, a great technical trick, a great mastery to do that. And the, the angel coming toward us is really moving through the air. It's really, it's, it's like a, a, something that's actually happening. You feel the rush of the air. You feel the astonishment of Abram and his perplexity. He's like a, he's, he's like a frightening old his head thrown back, and what about the gesture of Abram with his hand on the face of Isaac? It's a terrible gesture, you see, it's a cruel, terrible gesture. But it's the one that heightens the quality, the dramatic quality of the scene to a, almost a, a unbearable. It's the sacrifice of Isaac. 20 years later, And the, the, it, everything has changed. Everything is. Now look at the gesture in which he keeps Isaac from seeing. It's a, a gesture of such delicacy and of such love and of such despair. And look at the silent approach of the angel and that he holds his wrist. The, the whole thing has moved inside, and Isaac, you see, is part of the sacrifice. He is a willing part of the sacrifice. He's not bound up. He's kneeling, and he's kneeling beside his father, and it's an entirely, then the, then the meaning of it, the meaning of it as of an absolute obedience, obedience of Abram to God and of Isaac to his father, and therefore to God through his father to God, is the, is the meaning of, it's, a, it's the meaning of the story. But it's a meaning which uh, uh, Rembrandt is able to make clear to us so that we know what it means to obey. We know what it means to give up the thing we most value in the world. 
the thing which is most precious to us. And we know then the joy, because we've seen the tenderness of Abram. We've seen his love of Isaac, but his greater love of God. In terms of pain, of course, it's and such depth to the experience simply looking at it. In, in these few paintings that I can show you from the 60s, he raises life to a sacrament. He makes what is ordinary or commonplace or usual into something which is sacred. He, he actually elevates it to a realm which is this realm of mystery example of his use of the, of the most difficult stories of the Old Testament. Because this is the story, you know, of the, of the son who, who asked for his inheritance and was given his inheritance and went out into the world and spent it all in absolutely uh, foolish, the most foolish imaginable way. And this son was lost and is found. And the I suppose the most conspicuous thing sitting here is that I live in California, and therefore, like everybody else who lives here, I'm blessed. But then I'm thrice blessed because I live on a, a ranch in the country, and I have lots of animals, and that's uh, always been my great love and desire to have animals. I like just to feed them. I like to watch them chew, and and of course then when the little lambs born and goats and things. There's such a, such a joy and, and the promise so much of, that it's just a great pleasure to me. And then I've always been very fortunate in my work because I have, have been teaching the, the history of art. And for somebody who's a painter, there's nothing better to do because you have to spend all of your working hours looking at the best things that have ever been painted or ever been carved or ever been built in the world. And that's a, 
you know, not only just inherently a great joy, uh, but it's also, uh, uh, I think, at least some benefit to a person who's a painter because it gives you some uh, humility and it also gives you some strength that you couldn't possibly have otherwise. And I've been fortunate in, in my teaching to be able to teach the great periods of art. Um, so that everything about that has been lovely. And it was when I moved to Santa Cruz that I was able to combine a really ranch kind of life uh, with my teaching. I never expected to. I, I thought that was too much for anybody to hope for. And in, it is too much to hope for, but it happened just the same. So uh, that now, though I'm supposed to be retired, I still uh, teach at the university. And But I can teach exactly what I want because it isn't, a, you know, like teaching required courses or teaching within some kind of a idea that, uh, you know, more formal and professional kind of idea. So uh, altogether, I'm uh, happy, even if the Greeks don't approve of your saying that until you're dead, I uh, nonetheless say it, I'm happy.